Uh, greetings. Uh, this is Celebration. My name is John Savers. I'm your host. Uh, and today we will continue with our little series entitled Jews and Their Culture. Now, for those of you uh, who are new to uh, Celebration, uh, let me uh, advise you that this is a program which focuses on peoples and their cultures and tries to uh, uh, to get a better understanding, uh, to try to figure out what makes them tick. Um, uh, we have a feeling that the uh, establishment position on all things uh, uh, is not quite right. Uh, we, we feel that material omission is standard, uh, and in this particular era in which uh, global government uh, is the aim of uh, the powers that be, uh, there is often a demand that feel-good words and only feel-good words should be admitted. But unfortunately, uh, people are not uh, always uh, such uh, angels, shall we say, and um, uh, we, we think to have an understanding which is valid of peoples and their cultures uh, to understand uh, both the, um, the good and the bad, uh, uh, the indifferent and so forth. Uh, and thus to be able to get a rounded uh, view. Uh, we do, however, uh, uh, believe that uh, what is well known in a general way, uh, uh, which is uh, favorable, uh, should be acknowledged, is uh, uh, probable. Uh, what we're trying to do is to fill in the gaps uh, to um, uh, give some of the uh, uh, material omissions and so forth. Now, uh, in, in this process of um, providing the, uh, the big picture, as it were, um, uh, we do find that um, uh, some people are indeed hostile. Um, we, we think that uh, agents of the establishment uh, uh, try to um, uh, promote uh, uh, false notions in the uh, people's minds, uh, particularly those who have not uh, watched uh, celebration or any of the other programs for that matter uh, under my production, um, they, um, they, they have a way of trying to um, put out disinformation. However, uh, this sort of thing and mocking and all that kind of uh, annoying um, behavior is not new. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned in another episode, um, uh, it is, in fact, uh, something which has to be endured uh, if you are going to put forth information which the establishment does not want put out. Um, to that end, uh, I, I gave a citation. I think I'll give it again here uh, so you get some idea of the antiquity of this sort of thing. So please attend. But you draw near hither, sons of the sorceress, offspring of the adulterer and the harlot, of whom are you making sport? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood, inflaming yourself with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cleft of the rocks? Isaiah 57, 3, 5. And so it goes, uh, apparently. Um, so uh, on that uh, a note of uh, solidarity, shall we say, between uh, Isaiah and myself, we will proceed. Um, and uh, we, we want to give you a citation to kind of get things going. Gradually, the focus of Kabbalah switched to envisioning the divine realm itself. Early Kabbalah also concentrated on ways to ascend to the heavenly world, a process ironically called descending to the Merkava, the chariot, while still alive. This process always involved asceticism and meditation. It is important to note that Kabbalah was not a fad for kooks, as was once believed. We are told of four Tanaim involved in the Sanhedrin who explore the transcendent realm called Pard's paradise. One died 
One looked and became mentally ill. One looked and became a heretic. Only Rabbi Akiva ascended in peace and descended in peace. The fact that Rabbi Akiva uh, and uh, other sages were involved in this spiritual exploration emphasizes how mainstream Kabbalah was for the great scholars of that time. It continued to play a significant role in Jewish tradition, reaching its zenith in the 16th century. This is a citation of Rabbi David E. Kahn Lippmann, The Book of Jewish Knowledge, pages 206-207, fact 355. Well now, uh, the Rabbi Akiva, uh, which was referenced in this citation, uh, lived uh, uh, roughly in the time of Christ, uh, and um, uh, a rather noteworthy figure. Um, uh, we will say that in regard to this uh, whole business, um, some may say or, or think of this as um, basically people who want to be as God, uh, uh, ascending to the throne uh, of, uh, of God and so forth, um, without God's uh, approval, uh, perhaps without God uh, uh, wishing it, um, uh, a storming of the uh, heavens, as it were, uh, not, sent, not seen perhaps since uh, Nimrod's day. Um, but at any rate, um, uh, it's standard operating procedure for the occult. Um, and uh, we do see this as um, uh, something that's quite uh, influential. Um, in this particular uh, citation, uh, Rabbi Khan uh, Lippmann uh, said the matter had reached a zenith in the 16th century. I think this um, probably alludes to uh, Rabbi um, uh, Luria uh, and uh, his influence. And um, uh, there were some messianic uh, pretenders to the throne, so to speak, uh, in and about this time. But uh, I think that um, uh, these people are people who um, were getting more and more into what Halibi had referred to as, um, that is Rabbi uh, Ziv uh, ben, ben Shimon uh, Halibi, who wrote uh, The Way of the Kabbalah. Uh, his idea of um, the kind of a pure and splendid uh, uh, way, a concept, uh, he uh, alluded to as being vulgarized by some uh, in uh, Saudi Luria. Um, this is uh, perhaps the group that started trying to uh, have a practical uh, usage uh, through magic uh, and um, that sort of thing that um, uh, led uh, to a great deal of occult uh, work and um, uh, uh, solidarity with the uh, witchery of the day and uh, thereafter. Uh, I'm not sure that the zenith was reached in the 16th century. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, we're not in it right now, actually. But um, one thing is for sure, and that is that the Kabbalah uh, has been uh, quite influential uh, in Jewry uh, and therefore worth looking at uh, as we um, have that as our theme. Now, uh, let's go forward. During the Bar Kokhba revolt, one of Rabbi Akiva's greatest students, Shimon Bar Yochai, was forced to flee from the Romans. According to tradition, he escaped by hiding in a cave, some say buried up to his neck in dirt for 12 years, he naturally viewed everything Roman as an abomination, and he was quoted as saying, kill the best of the non-Jews. Uh, this rather extreme position is important simply as a balance against all of our tradition's wonderful expressions of ecumenism and uh, acceptance of the non-Jew. We had angry leaders. We were not always understanding and gentle. This is a citation from Rabbi David E. Kahn Lippmann, The Book of Jewish Knowledge, uh, page 205, fact 352. 
Well, I would certainly agree with Rabbi Khan Lippmann that this uh, was extreme. Um, how uh, broad uh, it is, I cannot say, uh, but um, there are some references uh, in the Talmud that um, do cause some apprehension. Um, uh, the, uh, the Talmud is, uh, is, is rather interesting because um, when there are disputes between rabbinic uh, schools uh, in regard to the interpretation, uh, it has been agreed that both rabbi or rabbinic schools are correct uh, in that uh, they reflect uh, the divine uh, inspiration uh, and, uh, and so forth. I mentioned already that in regard to uh, the ordinary Jews, they are abjured. Uh, when uh, a rabbi says that uh, left is right or, or right is left to, uh, to believe and accept. So uh, we do have these singularities here so that um, uh, although one is hopeful that uh, this um, rather extreme position as uh, Rabbi Khan Lippmann had it um, uh, is not uh, widespread, um, uh, you can't uh, really be uh, all that comfortable uh, uh, knowing that um, uh, these viewpoints uh, may come back uh, uh, as the generations proceed. Um, one, genera one generation may abhor such a notion, but the next generation may uh, decide that uh, it's quite appropriate. Schools do change. However, uh, let's go forward, and uh, perhaps we can give you another citation that uh, would um, kind of reinforce uh, the above. Hadrian regularly vacationed in Judea when he left in 132 CE, that's AD, war broke out. The Jews were led by a single man, Shimeon Bar Kosovo. Several leading rabbis, including Rabbi Akiva, believed he was the Messiah. Uh, they gave him the Messianic name Bar Kokhba, son of a star. Thus, his war was called the Bar Kokhba Revolt. It was different in many ways. First, all Jews were united under one leader, Bar Kokhba. There was no civil war. Second, Bar Kokhba was apparently a ruthless general. Stories uh, describe his method of selecting troops. They had to cut off one of their fingers to prove their dedication. This is a citation from Rabbi David E. Kahn Lippmann, the Book of Jewish Knowledge, page 204, fact 349. Now, it might be well at this point to kind of slide into our sick at non approach. Uh, so let's do that at this point in time. Thus, the whole people, Israel, the Jews misnamed, uh, in the form of the elect of the nation, gradually became the Messiah of the world, the Redeemer of mankind. Uh, Evangelist Ted R. Weiland, God's Covenant People, page 239, citing Joseph Klosner, The Messianic Idea in Israel, page 163. Well, in this particular citation, we see that there has been a movement uh, within Jewry conceptually in regard to the Messiah while Rabbi Akiva and others during the time of this revolt looked for a single individual uh, to uh, be the Messianic leader. Uh, by the time we reach uh, Joseph Klosner, uh, there is or has evolved a notion that um, uh, there would be a group Messiah uh, and that this group Messiah uh, would uh, accomplish all that the individual uh, might have plus more. Uh, and, uh, but on, on this particular uh, uh, line of thinking, let's proceed. He, the Jew, is the man of sorrows whose affliction is to bring healing to the world and to lead many to righteousness, Isaiah 1, 2, one, three. Now this is a citation from evangelist Ted R. Weiland, God's Covenant People, 
page 239, citing the Jewish Encyclopedia, 1904, volume 7, page 363. Well, uh, we understand now that uh, as Jewry uh, perhaps uh, gets its feet, so to speak, uh, and uh, gains the, uh, the ground needed, uh, there may be uh, wonderful transformations uh, for us all, um, at least for many of us. Um, uh, but uh, will these wonderful um, uh, salvational uh, deeds uh, affect us all? Well, now there is some reason to, to think that probably not would be the answer. Consider Israeli Torah scholars have ruled that the Torah maintains that the righteous of all nations have a place in the world to come, but not all religious Gentiles earn eternal life by virtue of observing their religion. And while the Christians uh, do generally accept the Hebrew Bible as truly from God, many of them uh, those who accept the so-called divinity of Jesus are idolaters according to the Torah, punishable by death, and certainly will not enjoy the world to come. Uh, this is a citation from Michael A. Hoffman II, Judaism's Strange Gods, page 75, citing a statement from the Israeli Mishon Mamre Torah scholars as it appeared on their website at http slash org Jew Fact Gentiles HTM on June 26, 2012, Haim Vital Street, Jerusalem. Well, um, Jews um, would probably take the point of view that unfortunately um, those who are recalcitrant uh, and insist on living on the dark or unclean side of the tree must face the uh, certainty of obliteration uh, as uh, evolution occurs and the left side of the tree is folded within the um, the right side, uh, the side of light. So it's unfortunate, but uh, these things do uh, happen. They seem to be destiny, I guess. But uh, let's go forward. Maimonides further decreed that any non-Jewish nation not subject to our jurisdiction, Tahat Yadinu, will be the target of Jewish holy war. This is a citation from Michael A. Hoffman II, Judaism's Strange Gods, page 73, citing Hilkot uh, Melahim 8, 9, 10, 10, 11. Also, see Gerald J. Blidstein, Holy War in Maimonidean Law, uh, in Perspectives on Maimonides, 1991. Well, all this talk of war and uh, fussing and feuding and so forth, uh, I hope it does not impel somebody out there to go out and throw a, a fist or something like this. Let us be cool here. Um, I do say this much, though, that um, the reference uh, earlier uh, in regard to uh, the uh, Bar Kokhba revolt uh, and the ruthless nature of uh, the, uh, the man uh, who led it uh, and who was called Bar Kokhba by Rabbi Akiva and others, uh, that um, uh, this is uh, probably a way of uh, acting and so forth which has caused uh, immolation uh, on the part of certain generals and, um, and whatnot of the Jewish uh, army uh, of today. Uh, and it probably has caused uh, such generals to be held in great esteem. I would imagine that Ariel Sharon uh, would be delighted to be compared to Bar Kokhba 
uh, and, uh, and so forth. But uh, insofar as uh, he has loyal followers, uh, I would imagine that at least some would uh, think of him as being uh, in this tradition. But uh, let's go forward. Uh, despite what some history books maintain, war would probably have broken out even without provocation from Emperor Hadrian. However, in 132 CE, that's AD, Hadrian declared Jerusalem to be a Roman city. To emphasize this point, he ordered the building of a temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mount. Rumors spread that Hadrian also intended to save Jewish babies from mutilation by forbidding circumcision. This is a citation from Rabbi David E. Kahn Lippmann, The Book of Jewish Knowledge, page 204, fact 349. Now, um, as the citation stated, um, a war against Hadrian or revolt was inevitable because uh, if he tried to bar circumcision, he was attacking the very identity of the Israelites, which uh, these Jews uh, claimed to be or to, um, to represent. Um, also, um, it, it might be said that uh, the plot of uh, Hadrian uh, in regard to the mount uh, seems to have been uh, effectively uh, uh, perpetrated by the Muslims, uh, and uh, this particular act seems to uh, have engendered a almost certain continuing struggle uh, in regard to this. What inferences uh, might uh, be um, derived from all this information? Uh, let's think about that a moment. A ritual is a kind of miracle play in which the state of man and his relationship to the world and God are set out in semi-dramatic form. Usually, it also describes an allegorical action, man's ascent, tests, and accomplishments in spiritual evolution and union with the Godhead. In Kabbalah, there are many types of ritual and every school or group has its own. Ziv bin Shimon Halivi, The Way of Kabbalah, pages 190-191. What logic have we unearthed in all this? Um, the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, UNCHR, has condemned Israel for war crimes and crimes against humanity for using disproportionate lethal force, including American-supplied helicopter gunships and tanks against Palestinian civilians. Uh, this is a citation from the Spotlight, November 6, 2000, front page article by Christopher Bolin. Furthermore, the Israeli state is not alone. Uh, consider. Meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon in the White House as Israeli tanks encircled Mr. Arafat's West Bank compound, Mr. Bush also said Israel has a right to retaliate against people in the Middle East who want to use terror as a way to derail any peace process. Uh, this is a citation from the Washington Times Tuesday June 11, 2002, front page article by Joseph Curl. Well, we see uh, through this that uh, President Bush uh, has indicated uh, seeing eye to eye with the Israeli leadership, uh, and we think that uh, uh, this will cause uh, a stiffening of the spine, so to speak, uh, in the part of the, uh, the leadership there. Please uh, get a good grip on your chair. This information is amazing. In Freemasonry, a European offshoot of Kabbalah, a man may have to spend years taking part in a ceremony before he is allowed to conduct it. Moreover, no one will teach him directly how to do it. He has to watch, observe, and absorb 
every tiny detail of the procedure so that it becomes second nature. If the lodge is a living one, he may draw on the mutual soul of its members and so join them all in the experience. This principle applies to all group ritual work. Have been Shimon Halivi, the way of Kabbalah, pages 191. Now, I, I want to give a caveat. Uh, this material is pretty amazing stuff. Uh, and those of you who uh, find such information difficult may want to excuse yourself at this point in time. One analogy for the first manifestation of will out of unmanifest existence is a dimensionless point. Now this dot of manifest existence uh, is the source of everything that was, is, and will be. It is I am. And in Kabbalah is called the first crown, the ancient one, and the white head. From here emanate the ten utterances that bring the relative world into being. In an instantaneous progression, the ten divine principles, the attributes of God or Sephiroth, are realized like an eternal lightning flash. Now, this is a citation from Ziv bin Shimon Halivi, The Way of Kabbalah, uh, page 28. That's it, folks. A wrap. We're out of time again. Uh, this is Celebration. Uh, my name is John Savers. I'm your host. I do appreciate your tuning in. Hope to see you again next time.